Hi everyone, my name is Lucy Lynn. Today I have two amazing guests. Larry, um, he is the founder of uh, Wikipedia and also the CIO of Everpedia. And I also have Theodore, um, who is the CEO of Everpedia. And we're here today to talk about what Everpedia is doing and then also the, I think the synergies that we can see to get more people into this space. Specifically, how do we get more of the community into the blockchain crypto space? Um, so I actually started programming games when I was like 11, 12 years old. So that's kind of how I got into coding. And by the time I was 14, I'd created this uh, so social network for gamers, so kind of like a Facebook, but for gamers. And I thought this was such a great idea that I actually dropped out of high school first year to pursue that. Um, but what happened was I ended up working, uh, I got an internship at a tech company where I ended up working for three years instead. So I kind of got my education through working at that company instead. Um, and then three years later, I, I quit my job there and I uh, founded Everypedia in Los Angeles with a friend that went to UCLA. Um, this was when I was 19 years old. Um, and our original vision with Everypedia was to build a more modern and inclusive version of Wikipedia. So both me and my friend Sam that I started with was uh, we were editors on Wikipedia or we edited Wikipedia and we basically felt like Wikipedia was the only top five website in the world that hadn't been updated in almost two decades. Whereas with like Facebook or Google or let's say like search engines, social networks, all these other aspects of the internet, there had been a bunch of competition throughout the years that have been driving like innovation forward, but with online encyclopedias, there had only been Wikipedia, nothing else, and they hadn't updated their design, their functionality, their community policies, or anything like that in almost two decades. So that's where we came up with the idea to start the Everypedia, which um, was kind of an attempt to build a more modern version, like I said, but also uh, an encyclopedia that covered a broader scope of content, whereas Wikipedia has very strict so-called notability standards on what can actually be accepted into the encyclopedia. Um, so English Wikipedia has like 5 million articles and so we were thinking why shouldn't it have like 50 million or 100 million because um, there's billions of people in the world with internet access and companies and organizations and stuff leaving behind a ton of information that's just like, scattered and unorganized across the internet. Um, so that was kind of the original vision with Everpedia and why we decided to start it back then. My name is Larry Sanger. Uh, I uh, am, my claim to fame is a uh, co-founder of Wikipedia um, and I actually am trained as a, a philosopher so I have a PhD in philosophy. Um, I, I've worked on a, a pretty long string of websites um, and uh, a, a few of them were, were uh, pretty successful besides Wikipedia. Um, a, a, a directory of educational videos called Watch No Learn, um, a, uh, a website for teaching kids to read, which is something I did with my two boys when they were one, mm -hmm. um, and so I sort of digitized the, the method of doing that on readingbear.org, and um, I've worked on actually a number of other uh, other projects. Well, bore you with all of them, um, but the, the focus has always been knowledge, uh, either reference or education, and organizing knowledge, especially um, using collaborative communities, um, and uh, which is uh, one of the reasons why I was uh, initially interested in what the guys were doing here. They, they gave me a call uh, a few months after they, they started working on it when they had something to show and, and um, I made an account, I think it was in 2015. 2016, yeah. yeah. Early 2016 maybe. And uh, I had this notion that the, the best way to improve on Wikipedia, because I'm, I'm long gone from Wikipedia, um, is to collect all the articles, all the encyclopedia articles in the world and make them available in a database and uh, rate them and also store metadata about the people doing the rating um, so that you can slice and dice the article ranking data based on items of identity like you know, nationality or politics or, or gender or um, expertise 
even communities of interest like mm -hmm. you know professional organizations or or uh, university faculty or who knows what yeah. right um, and no project like that exists right but blockchain is absolutely perfect for that uh, project and so we, we aren't working on that yet that's that's phase two right, right now we just we're, we're very happy to to uh, be able to uh, say that uh, as of uh, august we have been on the blockchain like you know obviously i think technology uh, needs to be updated um, quite frequently and innovation needs to drive forward so you know i think um, and it's great to see that you know wikipedia being so popular being so um so used uh, i think Definitely the next step is to move it to putting it on the blockchain. From, so from just tell, talking about that, what would putting, like, you know, being on EOS, putting it on the blockchain, what, what would be the biggest difference between Everpedia and, say, Wikipedia, in your opinion? The original sort of basic differences are uh, we, we have an updated design, which, which Ted here is uh, responsible for. Um, it just looks a lot better. Um, and uh, we also have no notability policy, which means I anyone uh, can write an article about anything. They can, you can write about an article about yourself, about your uh, business, about your products, about your, uh, your class, you know, uh, at, at, a, at a school or university, uh, really anything. And um, that's, uh, we think that's how it, it should be. It makes the project more open. But in addition, now we are the first major um, encyclopedia on the blockchain, and that is uh, it's a it's a huge difference. Um, I, I won't, as you say, I'm not going to go into the technical reasons why. Uh, suffice it to say that what the blockchain does is it decentralizes um, how we interact with each other. It's like the internet itself. It's an internet protocol. That, uh, that allows us to, to interact with each other, in this case, creating encyclopedia articles, editing encyclopedia articles, um, approving them, rating them, um, all without being beholden to uh, uh, an editorial uh, staff, and also without benefiting anyone other than the actual people who have um, earned tokens by, um, uh, by contributing or who have purchased tokens. One of the cool things about using blockchain technology with an encyclopedia is the, to the way the token economics works. And um, the way we're using it is that in order to create or edit an article, you have to stake a small amount of tokens as collateral. And then other uh, editors that have a stake in the network uh, through a, a pretty easy process has to either approve or dismiss the edits that are made by people. If it's dismissed, your collateral that you put in is essentially burnt. Uh, if it gets approved, you get your collateral back plus some more as a reward to incentivize you to create more content. Um, and so what this does is we're kind of using blockchain technology as an automatic quality mechanism that makes traditional um, you know, moderation and administration tools a little bit obsolete. Or it's, it's an attempt to make the process more automated with financial incentives. And the second thing, like Larry mentioned, is obviously um, censorship. So when, you, when you host a knowledge base on a centralized server, um, like Wikipedia does, there's a bunch of, it's obviously like one of the most censored websites in the world, censored in like most of the foreign uh, like dictatorships and stuff like that around the world. And that's because it is hosted on centralized servers. So you can block like one IP, one domain, one server. But if you host the entire knowledge base peer to peer, which is what we're doing, then there's no way to censor all of those like different nodes that are actually hosting the content. Um, and so this makes the knowledge base extremely censorship resistant in all those countries which is really exciting because countries like Turkey decided last year to completely censor completely block Wikipedia and now Turkish people can actually access all of Wikipedia and Everpedia through our network um, on the blockchain yeah no that's really fascinating because censorship I think is a an issue in a lot of global uh, in a lot of countries really and so you so now um, access to this knowledge could be used for the first time. You're saying in a lot, in many of these countries. How are you going about, um, say, building a community or getting your contributors to edit more, to build more content, um, and to get them to really become um, part of your ecosystem? You know, in the first few years, um, 
we were just talking uh, a lot. Um, these guys did uh, a, a fair few interviews and, and um, uh, just tried to uh, use SEO techniques to, to rope people in via popular topics. Um, and uh, that's still going on. Um, but uh, as we move on to the blockchain and we've got literally hundreds of thousands of people um, who are IQ holders because we did we did an airdrop um, last July um, that that means that basically we just deposited into uh, into the the accounts of uh, EOS holders uh, a, a corresponding amount of IQ which is our our token that means there's huge numbers of people just uh, ready and uh, with a built-in incentive to contribute to Everpedia. Um, we, we've essentially um, uh, launched the network with 51% ownership of the network uh, uh, by EOS holders. So um, I, I think that's, that's going to be uh, an interesting way to get things started, but that, there are a lot of old lessons, I think, that we need to heed as we move forward, and we've been talking about this internally. So one thing that, that we're going to be doing, because we've, we've got the, the back end, the, the um, technical details of the blockchain um, uh, sort of initially nailed down. It's pretty solid. There's still a lot of work to do, of course, um, but what we need to do now is to make the uh, the registration process really simple and seamless and um, uh, not not so complex because I mean if you're going to deal with any blockchain pr project for for technical reasons it actually is um, it's pretty pretty difficult to yeah. get involved a, a lot of times. Yeah, I mean I would say the the key thing to building a community fast is finding really good community members and community managers. Uh, so we're trying to scale globally. So what we're trying to do is find really good community managers in different countries that can represent those countries, Everpedia in those countries, and build out the encyclopedia in those native languages. Because um, it's kind of a kind of a circle that starts with a community manager. Because if you have a good community manager that recruits a lot of other community members and editors, and those people start creating a bunch bunch of content on the platform, and that content gets indexed on Google and search engines, um, and gets shared on social media and so forth, and then by doing that, you get more traffic to the site, more like regular just readers that are reading articles. And that's where we have the chance to convert more of that traffic to editors when they actually land on the site and, you know, bring up the incentives and all the stuff for why they should actually help edit and create content on the sites. So it all kind of goes back and starts with the community managers and them actually doing a good job. Yeah, I think community is a quite an interesting one. Like, I've, I've built a community from 60 to about 127,000 in um in the crypto community as well so um that is one good way in terms of the marketing plan um but yeah i mean but once they come like you know you definitely have to make sure that uh you listen to them very much and you get their feedback and uh and just make sure that you know um community management it's not an easy task like there's there's its ups and downs but from this perspective i think it being a community-driven initiative, which is what Everpedia is, 100%. Uh, I think you just need to engage your own community as much as possible and just yep. be. So it's so one thing that I've I've noticed uh, about a, a lot of of uh, blockchain projects, a lot of DApps um, that uh, tout <laughs> their status as being you know decentralized, and they're but they're not really. Um, they uh, uh, all of the policy making is being decided in house. They don't talk to their users very much, and um, if you're if you're creating an app that is really supposed to be um, decentralized, and your whole narrative, the story you tell, is all centered around the notion that you are organizing people. Right, not selling a product, but you're organizing people who become co-owners of a network. Then, the very first thing that you need to do to do with those people, and they need to be involved at, at, at every step of the way, um, 
is is to talk to them and you know make sure they're totally on board that they're, they're motivated and change things that are stopping them from getting stuff done so that's the second part of what your what you're thinking is next steps um can i ask you what what is besides say community and building your ecosystem is there any other things that you're focused on from a company perspective I think as Larry's mentioned before, one of the main things we're going to focus on now in the next couple of months is the UX and UI. Because I think one of the main issues, not just with um, the Everpedia network, which is in its first phase, um, but also like blockchain technology in general, is that it's not user friendly enough for normal people that are you know non technical to actually properly use it. I think you see this with a lot of other blockchain projects as well, where you know you have a lot of people that are interested in crypto and that are interested in like you know tech that kind of use it, but normies have no idea why they should be using it instead of like you know the centralized services um, so what we've done with uh, Everpedia um, now is that we've launched the first version of the Everpedia network and we made sure that all the back-end functionality which is listed in the white paper is actually properly in there and it actually works as intended and as described in the white paper because um, I think a lot of projects also do the mistake of trying to make something look really pretty and then it doesn't actually like function the way that you intend it to, to work. Um, so we kind of made sure from the start that all the functionality is in there and it works as intended. And now we're trying to clean up the UI and UX so that you're not supposed to need a tutorial on like how to get started using it. You should just be able to go to the site, sign up, and start creating articles. And it should be seamless and really easy. And, and we've also um, opened offices uh, recently. Uh, we moved from uh, LA and Westwood to Santa Monica. Um, and uh, Ted has uh, just opened uh, an office in Stockholm. Well, it sounds like a, you know, it sounds like you've got quite a big roadmap in front of you, uh, lots to do. Uh, I can't wait to, you know, see a more easier way of updating an encyclopedia than Wikipedia. Um, I think definitely one of the things that uh, crypto and blockchain has been accused of is that it is too complex and it is too difficult, uh, even just getting money inside wallets and the whole process. So glad to hear that you know, you're really focused on the UX UI because for sure this industry um, is not very good at that right now and uh, especially to try and get the mass adoption in, I think that needs to be fixed. So great to hear that you, know, you guys are really focused on that. All right, well, thank you so much for your time, Larry and, and Ted. And, uh, yeah, um, and glad, um, great to hear about this project, and I hope it goes really well. Thank you.